Praise be Jesus and Mary. I'm David Rodriguez, Content Director of the Fatima Center, and we're building on a firm foundation as we study the basics of our Catholic faith. Now, last week, we began our discussion on the supernatural virtue of faith, and we'll continue it this week. If you recall from last week, we said that faith is a supernatural gift of God, which enables us to believe without doubting whatever God has revealed, who can neither deceive nor be deceived. So today we're going to take a closer look at the, I would say, most definitive teaching that the church has, the most comprehensive teaching on faith at its highest level of authority, and that comes from the First Vatican Council. But before we begin, let's go ahead and start with a prayer again. We'll say the act of faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My God, I firmly believe that Thou art one God in three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I believe that Thy divine Son became man and died for our sins, and that He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe these and all the truths which the Holy Catholic Church teaches, because Thou hast revealed them, who canst neither deceive nor be deceived. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So as I said, today we're going to look at a document called De Filius. It's the Church's dogmatic constitution on faith from the First Vatican Council. This was promulgated on the 24th of April in the year of our Lord, 1870. Now the First Vatican Council only got to promulgate two documents, the other one called Pastor Eternos is on the papacy, papal infallibility. People know it quite well because of that document. Uh, but the First Vatican Council was then ended abruptly because the Italian revolutionaries, led by Vittorio Emanuele and Garibaldi and others, were, were invading Rome and were taking over the papal states. So the bishops had to return to their home, and uh, that ended the First Vatican Council. But they did get out this very important document. And again, it's very short. Uh, you can look it up. I do encourage you to read it. It only has four chapters. And each chapter in here in Denzinger's book is really just a page to two pages long. So these are short chapters. The third chapter is the one on faith. So it's the one that we'll look at right now. It has seven sections. I'll just give you the headings that Denzinger himself gives to these paragraphs. The definition of faith, that faith is consonant with reason, that faith in itself is a gift of God, the object of faith, the necessity of embracing faith and retaining it, the divine external aid for the fulfillment of the duty of the faith, and the divine internal aid for the fulfillment of the duty of the faith. And each one of those is just one short paragraph. So you could certainly look for it online. You can go to papalencyclicals.net, for example, and look up De Filius, First Vatican Council. Uh, you could read it with me. We'll probably also make it available online at our website, uh, same place where I place the notes for each class. So again, nothing can replace you yourself directly reading these documents of the church. They're simple to read. They're not complicated. They're not hard. Uh, I might read a little bit of the first paragraph just so you can get a sense of it. Um, interestingly also, this uh, constitution was unanimously accepted by all of the church fathers that were there at the council. These, uh, and then the first chapter is actually just on God, who created all things. The second is on revelation, so that's already putting things in context. And then the third is on faith, and then the fourth is on faith and reason. Now, that fourth chapter on faith and reason is also very good, uh, and if people have questions, we might actually go into it. So, so let me know again. You can always email those questions, uh, but I think that's a very important topic, connects very nicely to faith, uh, very important for today as well. And if people have questions on that, it might be worth taking one of our catechism episodes to look precisely at that relationship between faith and reason as expressed by the First Vatican Council. So looking at the definition of faith, this is how it begins. Since man is wholly dependent on God as his creator and Lord. So notice where everything's already in place for faith. It's because we're wholly dependent on God 
that we have this duty and responsibility to respond to God with faith. Uh, that first sentence is very important because it gives us the right context. Continues, And since created reason is completely subject to uncreated truth. So we have reason in our mind, created, God made it. Uncreated truth is God himself. God is the one who is uncreated. And so naturally, our created reason must always submit to uncreated truth. And so these are the reasons for faith. Because God made us, and we're subservient to him in all things, and clearly our reason is subject underneath his, submissive to him, who is truth, truth itself. Then the Council of Fathers continue. We are bound by faith to give full obedience of intellect and will to God who reveals. So God is revealing himself, and we have a duty, we're bound, to submit both our intellect and our will. And we talked about that last time. So you see, faith is an act of the intellect and an act of the will, those two faculties or powers of the soul. That's where faith resides. So all these are things we reviewed last time, but hopefully here you're seeing it in the authoritative teaching of an ecumenical council. Continues here. But the Catholic Church professes that this faith, which is the beginning of human salvation, is, here's your definition now, a supernatural virtue by which we, with the aid and the inspiration of the grace of God, believe that the things revealed by him are true, not because the intrinsic truth of the revealed things has been perceived by the natural light of reason, but because of the authority of God himself who reveals them, who can neither deceive nor be deceived. And so there you have the definition of faith. It's very similar to what we already had, but it goes a little bit more in depth. Obviously, supernatural virtue. We need the aid, the inspiration of God, so it only comes from God. Humans can't give it to each other. We're going to believe the things that he has revealed and that they're true. And then here's a little added thing, because this is what was coming under attack in the 18th century, uh, especially after a century or so in Europe of the Enlightenment and other problems like this. It says, we believe these things, this is faith, not because our own reason can grasp the intrinsic truth of these revealed things. So you may or may not get the fact that these things are true with your own reason. But, nevertheless, you still accept them. The natural light of reason may or may not perceive these, but that's not why we accept them as true. It is not dependent upon my own reason. Rather, it's because God himself, the authority of God, has revealed them. And we know that God has uncreated truth. We know that God knows all things. We know that God is all good and wants our salvation. And we know that God cannot deceive. He can never do something that's not true. And he can't be deceived. Therefore, it makes sense that we would accept all the things he reveals. So my own human reason can be deceived, and I can deceive people. That's a sin, but I can do it. Uh, God doesn't do those things. He can't be deceived, and he doesn't deceive. And so obviously, his truth is far superior to my own reason. And again, this is, I think, what's so important about faith and comes under fire a lot today. And while we have so many problems among many different Catholics, it's this notion that, well, if uh, it's a very sort of independent, free thinking, uh, and those are not good terms here, uh, way of thinking, and that's this notion that if it makes sense to me, if I get it, uh, if, if that is how I feel or jives with my opinions, then yes, I will go along with it. But if this is clearly uh, wrong and it doesn't make sense to my mind, I just can't understand how that would work, no, that, that can't be, then I don't accept it. Uh, a lot of people think that way and a lot of people approach religion that way, and so there might be a body of dogmas that the Catholic Church teaches, and you have uh, what goes by sort of a pejorative term, the cafeteria Catholic, who sort of goes and, and picks and chooses. Yeah, I, that dogma makes sense to me. I like it. I'll live my life according to that. And that doctrine, uh, I don't know about it. It's a little on the fence, and I doubt it. Uh, and that other dogma over there, yeah, no, that's clearly wrong, so I'm not going to accept that. Okay, that's what a lot of people do. And so it's not based on the authority of God himself, uncreated truth, but it's rather based on my own human reason. 
my own opinions. And then that's not faith. Okay, this, by the way, is also why we have to believe every single dogma that the Catholic Church teaches with, at, the, at the day fide level with this, uh, with this act of Catholic divine faith, the submission of the will and the intellect. Because as soon as you, as St. Thomas Aquinas teaches, as soon as you deny one of them, what you're showing is that even though you might, let's just say there are 100, I mean, there's more, but let's just say there's 100, and you accept 99% of them, but you don't accept 1% of them, there's one you don't accept. Then what that actually shows is that you're not accepting this on the authority of God. You're accepting it on your own authority. The authority of your own opinion, of your own created reason, you like these other 99 for whatever reason. They make sense to you. You want to live your life according to them, etc. But you don't like that one. So it's no longer based on the authority of God who reveals it, who can neither deceive nor be deceived. And therefore, it's actually not faith. It's not the supernatural virtue of faith anymore. Okay? You lose faith when you deny just one of the de fide dogmas of the church, knowingly and willfully. So if you willingly, if you knowingly, you know that this is something the church teaches infallibly and you willfully choose to doubt it or to deny it, then you do lose the gift of faith. And that is a, a terrible thing indeed because as the first paragraph there in De Filius also said, faith is the beginning of salvation. That, that's where salvation starts. So there, the First Vatican Council was actually quoting in its footnotes a statement made by the Council of Trent. And later on, the First Vatican Council goes on to quote another ecumenical council. This one is the Fourth Council of Constantinople, which was held back in 869, 870 AD. And there they quote the council saying, the first condition of salvation is to maintain the rule of the true faith. And that's not the only condition. There's going to be other things also that salvation requires. But the first, the very first rule, meaning you don't get started on this path towards salvation until you maintain the rule of the true faith. So that's very important there as well. Okay, then in the second paragraph it says, faith is consonant with reason. Uh, here we see God's goodness and mercy. Uh, so that our obedience of faith by our intellect and our will will not be in disagreement, it will be consonant with our human reason. God has willed to provide external proofs of his revelation. Okay, so there's not just the internal aid of the Holy Ghost working in our soul, but also gives us ex God also gives us external proofs. And I would say that those are crucial, they're very important, if this faith is to be universal, is to be accepted by all, is to be available to all. Also, if that faith is to be objective, so that there is something outside of myself. Remember, faith is outside of myself. It's not from within me. God gives me the faith. He infuses faith into me when I'm baptized. So when sanctifying grace is first given to you, then faith is infused into you, and you have it. Okay? And the only way you'll lose it is when you uh, willfully and knowingly doubt or deny one of those truths which God has revealed. Uh, but it's objective. And that's very important because that way it can be communicated to others. It's not purely subjective. It's not really subjective. Uh, it's definable. The faith has to believe certain tenets of, of truths, things that God has revealed. Um, so what are these external aids God has given us? Well, there's a number of them, but the sort of ones that are most often mentioned, or so the most important ones, are prophecy and miracles. So especially those external aids. Uh, they show forth God's omnipotence. He's all-powerful, so he can do all things. A miracle is a suspension of the natural laws, the natural laws of the universe. So when they're suspended, oh, God has that power. We can't do that ourselves. So that shows his omnipotence. Prophecy, it shows that he knows all things. It's important to recognize, for example, that the devil actually cannot uh, work real miracles. He can't suspend the laws of nature. And he can't do prophecy because he doesn't know all things. And God hides these things from him. So sometimes the devil can make it appear that he's uh, prophesying, but he's gotten the knowledge through some other way that is available to a angelic nature. Uh, so, for example, a famous thing that happened back during the Arian crisis was there were these two Arians, and they were trying to convince the emperor to be Arian. And so they were possessed by demons, and there was a battle that took place, 
and the demons saw the outcome of the battle, and of course the demons can travel at the speed of thought, so they let their false prophets know who won the battle, and these false prophets then told that to the emperor, and when you know news much, much later came talking about who had won the battle, the emperor was deceived into thinking that these false prophets had been prophetic. Uh, they hadn't been prophetic. Uh, the devil had just seen what had happened and couldn't travel fast in the speed of, speed of thought. So, um, when there's true miracles and there's true prophecy, that's a very good sign here, the external sign that God is giving us to help men uh, come to and believe faith. And those are suited to the intelligence of man, to our reason, right? Because a miracle... As we said, our reason can perceive these natural laws. And so if one time the natural law is violated, a saint bilocates or a saint levitates as an ecstasy. Well, my intelligence can comprehend something is going on here that is completely not normal and requires a supernatural power. Same thing with prophecy, because we all know how time works and you can't predict the future. So when it is, you know, our intelligence can perceive that. And this is an external aid to help us come to faith. Naturally then, those who wish to attack and destroy the faith have to negate these. They have to go especially after miracles and deny all the miracles, and they have to go after prophecy and deny that as well. And so you will see that all around. You'll see that in heretics, you'll see that in modernists, you'll see that in people who want to attack the Catholic faith. They will a priori disbelieve miracles. There's uh, a great quote by Chesterton that I really like. I don't have it with me, so I'm just sort of going to uh, paraphrase it. But he says, this very strange notion has come about that those who accept miracles do so on account of some dogma of the faith. He goes, but that's actually not true. People only accept miracles because they have the proof for it. They have some kind of evidence that their senses have perceived. He says, it's quite the opposite that's true. Those who reject miracles outright are the ones who do so on a dogmatic belief that miracles simply aren't possible, and they do that in the face of much evidence. They still just reject it and say, no, I won't believe the miracle. Uh, so again, those who want to attack the Catholic faith, uncreated truth, God himself, what God has revealed, are going to always be attacking and denying and belittling and mitigating the miracles and also the prophecies that God has given us. But because God gives us these proofs and because God has revealed it, our belief in these things has to be firm, unshakable. Because again, we're taking it on God's word. He's the one who's revealed it. Okay, the next paragraph then talks about how faith itself is a gift from God. And it mentions specifically that it's not a blind movement of the intellect. Okay, here we're going back to a lot of false notions about faith. Uh, some of them, in particular, were begun, were begun by a Danish uh, philosopher, I guess you could call him. His name is Soren Kierkegaard. He got very frustrated with the Danish Lutheran Church, saw them as hypocrites, etc. And he came up with his new understanding of faith. Basically, he said, faith has nothing to do with doctrine. So he divorces faith from doctrine. And that's a big problem with us still today. He says, faith does not require tangible evidence. So that goes against this denial of the miracles and the prophecy. Okay, well, yeah, if you're not in the Catholic faith, you don't have miracles and prophecies, so you're going to want to disassociate those two. He said that faith is just a, a passionate commitment to God, which sounds real flowery, sounds real nice and beautiful, but since you have no definitions, you don't even know who God is or what he's revealing, uh, and it's just this passionate commitment to, well, I guess you invent God however you want. So his vision of faith basically means whatever you want it to mean, and it just means you have this passionate commitment, leap of faith, again, you can't verify it with reason, and it has no, no objectivity to it. It's purely subjective. Uh, so this was Soren Kierkegaard's notion of faith, and it has become very, very popular all over uh, every different uh, denomination, and certainly within the Catholic Church itself. Unfortunately, you'll hear you know, echoes of Soren Kierkegaard's false, not false idea, uh, a blind movement of the intellect. That, that's not what faith is. Uh, Pius X, Pope St. Pius X in his document, Pascendi Donci Gregis, also attacks the modernist understanding of faith. And honestly, it's very similar to what Kierkegaard has. I mean, again, read his document. It's a little difficult to follow because the modernists, you know, they're, they're all over the place and they don't want to give you a definition very clearly. So they never want to describe things because, again, for the modernists, he wants faith to be whatever, whatever he wants it to be. 
But basically, he says, the modernist does, that faith comes, first of all, from within man. So again, it denies the fact that faith is external to us, and that faith comes from God, and that faith is infused into us by grace. No, for the modernist, faith wells up from within you. Okay, so it's coming from inside of him. And it's this interior sense that men have. So again, purely subjective, no objective criteria. And that it basically originates in man's need for the divine. I have some need for the divine, often unconscious. And that sense that I have of that need for the divine is what faith is. Now, if you understand that, great. Then you understand the modernist better than I do. Because that's what the modernist says, and that's how Pius X explains him in Pashendi. But what exactly that means, I, I still don't know. That's how slippery and wily uh, the modernist is. He'll never give you anything real clear, so he can constantly change it. So faith can mean one thing then, and one faith thing later, and faith can be one thing for you, and one thing for another person. Okay? There's nothing to sort of hold, hold him firm. That, that is the modernist, and of course he divorces uh, faith from doctrine as well goes on to talk about how this divine need we have, that divine need is unknowable. <laughs> so um, it's just a sense you've got of it. That's faith for the modernist, faith for Kierkegaard. That's not Catholic faith. But those are the notions that are so prevalent today. So I hope you can sort of identify them when people are talking this way and reject that and say, that is not faith. That is not of my intellect and my will submitting to the truths that God has revealed to every single one of them. Because if I deny one of them, knowingly and willingly, then it's no longer faith. Faith does certainly require the illumination of the Holy Ghost, as we've said. So the Catholic faith has to be supernatural. It can exist without charity. So you can lose the supernatural gift of charity, but still have faith. Uh, now, if you lose a supernatural gift of charity, mortal sin, and you die in that state, you're not going to heaven. So you can still have faith uh, and then not go to heaven. That's why faith is just the beginning of salvation. Nevertheless, it is a free obedience that man has to give, right? So God gives you the grace, but you've got to cooperate with it. You can resist it. So men can resist the grace of faith that God is giving them. Here we're touching now on the mystery of grace and free will, which is pretty complicated, but you need both. You need God's grace given to you and man's free will. And neither of those two can be denied. And because of that, De Filius, First Vatican Council, actually speaks of faith as a work, which pertains to salvation. So this is our last point for today because so often faith and works are contrasted in the discussions when Catholics begin to talk with Protestants. It's a complete misunderstanding of what work means. Uh, they take St. Paul talking about the works of the Old Testament, which are not works being done by supernatural grace. Works done by the baptized Christian who has supernatural grace, that's a completely different kind of work because God's grace is operative and then the human being's uh, free will is cooperating with God's grace. And these can be then works, works of charity, for example, spiritual, corporal works of mercy. Uh, but faith is also then a work that man has to do because he's getting God's grace, but he can resist it. Now, if he cooperates with it, he accepts the faith and nurtures it and takes care of it and helps it grow and lives by it, uh, that's a work. That is a work, the work of faith. And that is that first step towards salvation. So these are just some of the basic things that the First Vatican Council of the Aphelius is teaching us regarding faith, but of course all very important. We're going to continue then next time with this subject of the supernatural virtue of faith, continuing with our catechism questions, and using a couple of other helpful resources to get a better grasp of uh, what faith really is, because it's so important to understand faith for, for us as Catholics. Um, Please do email me any of your questions that you might have. Again, uh, the number is there at our website. You can email me at info at fatima.org, or you can also call us 1-800-263-8160. Thank you very much for all of those who have been donating. Uh, we really do appreciate that. Every small donation counts. Uh, if you haven't donated, please do consider uh, sending the Fatima Center part of your tithe. Um, those donations are so very necessary, and we gratefully appreciate every one of them. And also, please pray for us. Uh, please pray for the consecration of Russia. Let's go ahead and close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. O oh Lord, increase our faith. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Come, Holy Ghost. 
enlighten my mind, strengthen my will, and inflame my heart. Sweetheart of Mary, be our salvation. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. May you all have a blessed and grace-filled week.